So the previous video was uh, very much uh, focused on the statistical theory. For the sake of balance, I want to also give you some uh, feel more feeling about the empirical work in econometrics. And uh, I will now introduce you the empirical example that I will, I will use very extensively in the first part of the course. And I have found it very useful to work with the housing market example. It's a very nice example because um, everyone has to live somewhere, so we all, all have some first-hand uh, own experience of, uh, of, uh, of housing market. And uh, we understand that, uh, that uh, obviously the characteristics like uh, size and location and condition of an apartment or house uh, must affect the value, whether it's the sales price or the rental price. Uh, that uh, that's, uh, doesn't really matter. So we all are, to some extent, experts of this, uh, this area. And it's possible to understand this, uh, this kind of model without any, any knowledge of uh, economic theory. However, for those of you who are interested in economic theory, I want to also mention that there is also more deeper, uh, a deeper basis with this kind of modeling, that actually there is also like a lot of uh, rigorous economic theory going on behind this kind of uh, modeling. And this is where this hedonic modeling of housing markets uh, refers to. So if you, if you have taken some introductory courses in uh, microeconomics or economics in general, then uh, think about the consumer theory there. And uh, typically then the preferences of the consumer are defined over some bundle of goods. So you have some kind of homogeneous good uh, uh, in abstract level, something like foods and clothes, and then consumers are making some choices uh, and we have some... Uh, indifference curves and budget uh, lines for the for the foods and clothes and uh, basic idea is that uh, the more is better the more clothes and more goods is making the consumer happier but then how do we model some more more uh, more complex and more expensive commodities such as a house normally we don't need many houses we have a, we are fortunate to have one same is for for uh, consumer durables such as cars or 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 washing machines. You don't need many of them. You just need one. So uh, this is then where the hedonic modeling comes from. So so then there are uh, studies. Uh, for example, Kelvin Lancaster in the UK had a paper in uh, 1966, and Sherwin Rosen in the USA had a had a landmark paper in 1974 where they then model the uh, commodities such as the house uh, as a bundle of attributes. So in some sense, if you buy a house, you don't buy just a house, but you also buy a, a complex bundle of different attributes such as size and location and condition and vintage. And when a consumer is making a choice between different houses, then, then uh, he or she is comparing these uh, uh, bundles of attributes. And the, in terms of uh, microeconomic theory, then uh, the idea would be to maximize utility over those attributes subject to some budget constraints or what kind of uh, house you can, can, uh, can, uh, can afford to. So, um, again, this is a nice example because there is uh, some deep economic theory behind it, but also, also it's very easy to understand this example without going through to this kind of, kind of, uh, kind of theory. So it's very, very intuitive also for, for anybody. So to model this kind of housing market, uh, I, will, I will start by using, using uh, some uh, bit simpler data from, uh, from ESPO housing market, particularly the district of Tapiola. And I generated this example when the bachelor program of our school moved to, moved to Otaniemi. So Tapiola is a uh, uh, right next door from from uh, from Otaniemi, and this uh, data have been retrieved from this uh, this uh, free website. I have here the here the link, but I will also also put the put the Excel file with the data to on the available on the course website. So if you are interested in replicating these examples, I think it can be a very good uh, good way to to learn so and make sure that you have understood this uh, this uh, uh, what we will be doing with this uh, this data later on. So the data is available on the on the course website, and I will start from a simpler 
and then I will add more, more and more characteristics from this uh, from this data as we proceed. So here are some of the some of the descriptive statistics of this data. So so there were uh, sample sizes sixty seven. So it means that there were uh, sixty seven uh, apartments or houses sold. Uh, actually, I think all of these observations are apartments in in Tapiola. Uh, so this is data that covers one year. And so it means that there were 67 apartments uh, sold during that, that year uh, for the average price of uh, 308,000 euros. Average uh, apartment size was 62 square meters. Uh, there were, on average, there were two rooms, but there were also, also one room and, and even, even five room apartments. Uh, and uh, average age was 39 nine years. And uh, here are some kind of descriptive statistics that you can you can you can also also uh, read that uh, for example if you think about the price distribution this uh, this uh, descriptive statistics uh, indicate that the price distribution is quite quite skewed so for example if you compare the mean price and median price median is much lower than the average and uh, and uh, you can see also that the maximum price was uh, more than 1.2 million so typically then then of course uh, majority of apartments are uh, or half of the apartments were sold for less than 250,000 euros but there were also also expensive apartments with cost over over 1 million euro so this is why i mentioned also earlier that uh, that it's important that you are able to read descriptive statistics because uh, i do not have time in this course to go through the definitions and uh, descriptions of this kind of descriptive statistics you get more information if you if you can read data like this so then let's go to the economic modeling and uh, and uh, think about um, the the inverse demand uh, function for the for the characteristics and um, the, to start with let's just uh, consider one one important characteristic characteristic which would be the size of apartment in square meters which i have here indicated by s and suppose that the inverse demand uh, function is just linear so so price of apartment is a is a linear function of the of the size of apartment and uh, we have this uh, what what i will call as as variables in this in this uh, in this equation are this p and s for price and uh, quantity if you like uh, and uh, that would be the, the variables of the linear demand function. And then I have some parameters uh, of this demand. So this beta one and beta two are the intercept and slope coefficient that uh, characterize this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, inverse demand function. I will also make it, a, make it a more statistical model by adding there also this uh, disturbance term epsilon, can be also called the error term because uh, not all of the observations are actually falling nicely to this uh, inverse linear inverse demand function there's also some some deviations and uh, you can think about also that uh, that of course these uh, apartments are not identical in other respects than size uh, some have a better location than others some have more rooms than others and so on and so on so any kind of deviations from this this uh, inverse demand function then will not necessarily go to this disturbance term epsilon so we can then then start from this kind of uh, uh, economic modeling and postulate some kind of uh, uh, linear inverse demand function and so on but then when we go to the to the estimating these parameter estimates then we go to the regression model so we can then go to the uh, single linear regression model and uh, now it is a critical point that that uh, that uh, I want to emphasize. So typically, in the in the regression analysis, uh, we denote the dependent variable. Uh, this is very generic notation to use y for the dependent variable and x for the independent variables, which I can also call regressors. So so this is very common notation, and the idea is that. Uh, the direction of causality runs from x to y so x is independently determined like for example what is the the size of apartment in square meters uh, 
and and the size of uh, size of apartment it influences the price but but once the apartment is built of course the price doesn't influence the size so so if the let's say there is some kind of housing market bubble and the price is suddenly drop it doesn't mean that the 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 apartment size would somehow be influenced by the market prices of the apartments so clearly in this example it's it's obvious that the direction of causality is that that, that the size of apartment influences the price but price doesn't influence the 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 quantity so another reason why i i highlighted this x and y although this is very very typical notation in the in the statistics and econometrics literature i want to highlight this this y and x for you that uh, that uh, these variables are just data okay so here is the common common kind of um, uh, difficulty to understand for students coming coming right from the from the high school because uh, because in the school mathematics uh, uh, what is what is the, the symbol for unknown variable if you are solving some equations then always the unknown is denoted by x at least in Finnish schools probably in other schools as well so most of them are probably used to think about the x and y as the unknowns but uh, in this context x and y are not unknown this is observed data you have these uh, these measurements in your data set there's nothing uncertain or unknown about x and y in fact it's actually these parameters beta so beta 1 and beta 2 are the unknowns here not x and y but beta 1 and beta 2 so it's important that you you adjust your thinking to to this uh, this kind of symbols that no longer y and x are unknowns here they are observed data and it's these parameters beta 1 and beta 2 that are the unknowns that we need to estimate and this estimation is also then a bit more complicated by this disturbance term epsilon so the presence of epsilon in the equation but that also makes it kind of uh, uh, challenging and fun for the purposes of the econometrician okay so keep in mind x and y are not unknowns to be solved they are just observed data and uh, this is also in in the case of regression analysis uh, uh, this kind of regression equation it's very generic you, you, you can you can then just plug in any kind of variables in this y and x so not only this uh, price and size of apartment but any kind of uh, variables that we want to model in the in the regression model we can just uh, substitute in place of y and x and this is why also this this y and x are kind of kind of used rather than b and s so you don't need to every time revise our regression equation depending on what kind of variables we are putting in the equation So then let's go to the interpretation of this parameter. So as I mentioned, it's these parameters beta that are of interest. Those are the unknowns that we need to solve. And uh, I will use this symbol beta one uh, for the for the intercept term. So I want you to also have a have a develop a clear understanding of what is this graphical in interpretation of this uh, beta one and beta two. I come back to that uh, shortly. But uh, we, in the present context, we can think about this intercept beta one as the price of a hypothetical apartment that has only zero square meters of space. So it would be like a price of a simply address without any, any, any square meters to live on. That's, uh, sometimes the intercept term has a, has a more meaningful and useful interpretation than this, but sometimes, sometimes not. So, very often, actually, this beta one is not so much interesting to us. Like in the present example, it's not really that uh, meaningful concept, but it's anyway useful to have it in the model. The more in interesting, typically for us, our purposes is the slope coefficient, which is indicated by beta two. So that has this kind of interpretation of the marginal value of additional square meter of space in the present context. So, so typically, in econometrics, we are particularly interested in this marginal effect. What is the marginal effect of x on, on dependent variable y? So this is also, we can, we can see it if we differentiate the regression equation, what's the marginal, uh, marginal price of the, uh, what, what's the, how much the price increases if the, if the size increases by, by, by one unit. 
So then, then this beta two gives directly this kind of like marginal, uh, marginal, uh, marginal cost of one one additional square meter. So then, what about this uh, disturbance term epsilon or error term epsilon? So in some sense, from the statistical point of view, this is where most of the action actually is in the in the in the econometric modeling. So this uh, this epsilon is the is the random variable, and much of the statistical theory then is is actually analyzing this epsilon. So it's important to have a understanding that what does this uh, epsilon capture. So in fact, it everything that we do not explicitly control for in the deterministic part of the equation, which is this beta one plus beta two times x, then everything ends up to this epsilon. So again, anything that we do not control for with these x variables, it ends up to epsilon. So this would be, for example, then omitted factors. Well, omitted factors in the in the context of the housing market, we would uh, mean, for example, location of the apartment, which would be very very important, but uh, but uh, may be difficult to measure. There may be some kind of. Uh, aggregation bias for example which is not really i don't have a good example in the housing market context but uh, but for example if you have some macroeconomic variables such as gdp or unemployment and so on so there may be some difficulties to aggregate from the from the individual companies and and uh, and uh, individual agents of the economy to the aggregate level of the country there can be model misspecification. There might be might be some uh, something, and um, one part of the model misspecification would be functional misspecification, which would mean here that okay, we had assumed a linear relationship between the size of apartment and the price. So, but what if we have some non-linearities? So, I will discuss more about this kind of uh, indeed model mis model misspecification issues, functional form misspecification and also possible impacts of measurement errors during this course, as well as also omitted factors and omitted variable bias. So all of these kind of issues can, can, uh, can cause also bias in our estimation, but in, in certain conditions we can also harmlessly attribute them to the, to the error term. So again, this epsilon just captures any kind of sources of deviations from this, uh, this uh, linear regression equation that we have, uh, and uh, and uh, this is also then from the statistician's point of view this is where the where the action is so let's then have a little bit more detailed look at the data so as a starting point i have here uh, produced this kind of scatter plot of uh, of uh, apartment size on the horizontal axis and the price on the vertical axis so I will use this kind of scatter plots quite a, quite a lot, and uh, here on this on this two variable case, uh, then each blue dot on this diagram indicates one observed uh, apartment. And um, I wanted to still highlight that these uh, these data come from uh, real transactions, so these these apartments have been actually bought by someone and sold by by another another person. So they are not just advertisements, but uh, but uh, real transactions. And uh, so then, when we estimate the estimate the regression equation, and uh, this OLS on the slide refers to ordinary least squares, which is the most widely used uh, used technique, and it's the topic of the next uh, next uh, le lessons too to go into more detail to the linear regression model and OLS estimation. So if you want to do this kind of OLS estimation in the case of a single regression, and uh, we have done this kind of um, I mean, this, uh, this uh, scatter plot has been done simply in Excel. So we can always use in Excel also this kind of uh, option to add a trend line. So if we add a linear trend line, uh, which is the red line over here, we can also get, uh, get uh, this uh, estimated regression equation. And uh, this would be the very simple way of doing, doing linear regression analysis in Excel. Just add the trend line and display the display the regression equation. So I will come later in this course to the interpretation of this R squared statistic and what does that mean? But uh, here you can see on this slide, this, uh, this red line is just uh, 
just uh, fitting the the line on this uh, on this uh, on this scatter of data uh, this is very intuitive way of thinking about the regression analysis so we are just trying to fit in the the regression line in the middle of the scatter of uh, data and uh, to do so then then uh, or as a result of that kind of fitting the line we get also the uh, regression equation and notice that in in this excel uh, excel uh, trend line is presented so that we have this uh, uh, estimated uh, slope coefficient beta 2 is indicated first so that we have this uh, estimate of the beta 2 is uh, 5460.7 times x and then this constant uh, beta 1, uh, so estimate for this beta 1 is uh, minus uh, 31,431. Okay, so that's how, how it is somehow in Excel. It's the uh, other way around that in, in, in the usual uh, econometric and statistic texts. And uh, I mentioned the graphical Ill uh, interpretation, so I think it's very useful to have a sound understanding of What's the meaning of the regression equation uh, in terms of this kind of scatter plot and, uh, and two-dimensional two -dimensional graph? So think about now this uh, intercept term, why, why it is intercept and what's the meaning of this minus 31,000? So if you would now try to extend this red line, this red regression line uh, leftwards towards, to, towards the case where we have a uh, uh, zero square meters of space. Of course, this kind of hypothetical apartment cannot be even in principle. So the smallest apartments in Tapiola had more than 20 square meters of space in this sample. But suppose that you would con continue this uh, and extend this red line towards the zero square meters. Then actually this, uh, this um, uh, price would go actually below zero. It would be actually minus 31,000 and negative. So this, uh, this red line doesn't hit exactly the origin of this, of this diagram, but it goes slightly below there. So my, minus 31,000 is this intercept where the regression line is, is crossing this uh, uh, zero value of the horizontal axis. So that's the graphical interpretation of the, of the intercept term. So what's the meaning of the slope then? So, so that would be the marginal, marginal impact on price if the, if the size is increasing by, by, by one square meter. So uh, take, for example, this um, as a reference point on this diagram, you can think about this 80 square meters. So notice that, uh, that this uh, uh, red regression line indicates that uh, if you have 80 square meters uh, of space in the apartment, uh, then uh, uh, the the red line would indicate that uh, the expected price would be approximately 400,000 euros in this Tapiola housing markets. That's how to read it. If, if you had, uh, had uh, 100 square meters, then it would be a bit more than 500,000 and so on. So if you take, for example, this reference point of 80 square meters, so what's the interpretation of the slope coefficient, 5,460? So it means that if you would move, if, if the size of apartment uh, would increase by one square meter from 80 square meters to 81 square meters. So then if uh, 80 square meters of space cost uh, 400,000, then 81 square meters would cost uh, 405,000 and then, then 82 square meters would be 410,000 and so on. So each square meter cost approximately 5,500 perhaps. That's the interpretation of the slope. So at this point, I think it's important that you develop very, very uh, good understanding of what's, what's the, uh, or intuitive understanding, what's the, what's the graphical interpretation of the, of the intercept coefficient and slope coefficient. That might sound very, very easy and trivial to you, but, uh, but uh, and if that is the case, that's, that's wonderful. But if not, then, then, then uh, it's good to practice. What is the graphical interpretation of the, of the line in, in this kind of two-dimensional space? Because we will, we will consider this type of diagrams quite, quite often in this course. So here is still, still a summary of this uh, 
uh, intercept and slope and how to interpret. So you could think about this intercept as some kind of fixed cost in the, in the apartment. In fact, uh, this is kind of a, a fixed premium because the cost is, cost is negative. And uh, then uh, in this, uh, this uh, tapiola housing market, uh, the interpretation of this uh, slope coefficient 5,461 per square meters would be marginal cost of an additional space or marginal benefit if you are selling the apartment, marginal cost if you are buying. So here is one more interesting observation. So if you just take the average price per square meter of these apartments in the sample, we find that the, the average price per square meter is only 4,930. And uh, in some sense, this is also, also maybe a sobering observation that, uh, that uh, very often when, when there is a discussion of housing market in the media, discussion tends to go to this average price per square meter in certain areas or, or how it is changing over time. But actually, perhaps this, uh, this uh, marginal cost per space is, is more, more relevant in, in many ways. And that can be smaller or bigger than the average price per square meter, depending on the, depending on the area. So, so in some sense, if you're, if you're buying, for, buying a house or selling your house and want to evaluate it relative to what would be the fair market price for your for your apartment or what would be a, if you're interested in some 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 cost then then it's not necessarily always good to compare just the uh, average price per square meter actually this marginal uh, marginal cost of uh, square meter can be much more important and relevant for this kind of uh, assessment so i will continue discussing this uh, empirical example in the in the um, in the following lectures, almost throughout the half of the course at least, and uh, I will then introduce towards the end of the course some other examples, for example, when we, when we need to use some time series or panel. So this is a cross-section because uh, all these apartments are observed, uh, all these transactions are observed in, in, the, in a given time horizon of, of, of one year, but we do not see the development of these prices over time in this particular data set. So as the, as the final topic, actually it should be 1D, uh, I will also then briefly discuss some, uh, some uh, relevant concerns in what kind of econometric software to use in this course, but also perhaps uh, in, your, in your professional life. So thanks for your attention and uh, see you in the next lesson.